Hello, everybody. Welcome to Science Division Live at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. My name is Joe Sertich. I'm the curator of dinosaurs at the museum. And I'm excited to share with you today a bunch of the history and some of the new science behind horned dinosaurs from here in Colorado. So right now, I'm going to share my screen with you and show you some cool pictures. You can't give a, a dinosaur talk without some cool dinosaur pictures. There we go. All right, so dinosaurs are obviously my specialty, and horned dinosaurs are my favorite type of dinosaur. I spend most of my time running around the American West looking for dinosaurs just like this. This is a Triceratops. And horned dinosaurs appear in the late Cretaceous. They're among the most diverse and strangest looking dinosaurs out there. Of all these species you see on your screen right now, only one of them is found outside of Western North America. One of the most crazy, bizarre groups of animals out there. And we're really lucky here in Colorado because we have a ton of different horned dinosaur uh, discoveries and species located right here in the state. A lot of the ones you saw on the previous slide are known from Canada, uh, northern Montana, and even down into Utah and New Mexico. But we're really lucky here in Colorado because not only do we sit right on horned dinosaur territory in Denver, but they're known from other parts of the state as well. Um, again, they're also only known from the late Cretaceous. So look at the top of the screen there, you can see the, the geologic time scale. Those two arrows are the times where we know dinosaurs from here in Colorado. Right now, I'm gonna focus on an area in this circle. This is called the Denver Basin. This is a picture of what the rocks in the Denver Basin look like. Uh, that pink line that crosses through there is actually the KT boundary or the KPG boundary. That's where dinosaurs go extinct. So everything on the outside of that pink line is dinosaur territory, and everything on the inside of that line comes after the dinosaurs. That's the time of mammals. And some of you might have been following the news over the last six months or so. We unveiled a crazy new discovery from near Colorado Springs from just across that pink line. These are some of the mammal skulls, and we also have turtles and crocodiles from near Colorado Springs about 65.9 million years ago. But I'm here to talk to you about these guys, and the Denver Basin is rich with horned dinosaurs. Um, not only horned dinosaurs, but some of these other dinosaurs, the ones in the foreground are called Ornithomimus osteomimus dinosaurs. Those have also been found here in the Denver area. And if we plot out all of the known fossil localities across the Denver metro area, each of these little red dots is a fossil discovery, and each of the little dinosaurs that you see on there is a horned dinosaur discovery. And what's crazy is that horned dinosaurs are known from basically right in downtown Denver. In fact, that first little one that you see right in the middle, right to the left of the name Denver, is the very first discovery of a horned dinosaur ever. This pair of horns from the eyes up, and it was first discovered in 1887 and sent off to a paleontologist out east, Othniel Charles Marsh, who first misidentified it as a type of bison. He called it bison alpicornis. Alpicornis means tall horn. So he thought it was the tall horned bison. Uh, at the same time, other discoveries were happening up in Wyoming. And it didn't take long before paleontologists realized that this actually belonged to a triceratops. The very first set of horns, the very first evidence of horned dinosaurs comes from 1887, right here in Denver. The next discovery, at least one of the coolest significant discoveries in Denver, is just behind that little, that little triceratops near Denver, so the little dot right by the D of Denver. And that's this guy. So my, you might be familiar with Dinger, the, Ro the Rockies baseball mascot. Dinger was uh, named on the basis of a discovery from Coors Field. So when they were constructing Coors Field, uh, construction workers discovered a little piece of bone. It was attributed to Triceratops, but we don't know. Here it is located on the skeleton. Can you see it there? Zoom in for you. There's what we know of Dinger. And there it is. So just a little tiny rib fragment. So I've put Triceratops at the top in quotation marks because there's no way that we can be sure that that little tiny rib fragment actually comes from a Triceratops. Although it's the most logical type of dinosaur to attribute Dinger to, given how prevalent they are here in the Denver area. The next one I want to talk about is all the way up in the upper right. So the little red one up in the town of Brighton, Colorado, 
If you've ever visited the museum and come to our prehistoric journey exhibit, you've probably seen this skull on display. This is a triceratops skull that was cut right down the middle by a construction worker with a bulldozer. You'll notice that the frill, the shield behind the head is broken and the other horn, the left horn, is missing. And what's really cool about triceratops is we've been able to piece together a really neat story from all the fossils up north in places like the Dakotas, Montana, and Wyoming. And we know that there are at least two distinct species of triceratops. The one on the top is called Triceratops versus, and the one on the bottom is called Triceratops horridus. So if we put up the Brighton skull, let me flip it around so it's facing the right way for you. The main difference between these two different types of Triceratops is in the nose horn. So notice the nose horn of the Brighton Triceratops, pretty low, uh, it's more of a bump on the nose. So of the two to the left, which one do you think it is? Actually the bottom one. Triceratops horrida. So we're going to come back to this in a little bit because there's some really cool science that we can probably do given the fact that this looks like a Triceratops horrida. The next one I'm going to talk about is one that we found exactly a year ago, the one at the very bottom of your screen down in Highlands Ranch, just south of Littleton there on your screen. So just a year ago, we got a call from a construction company building an assisted living facility down near Chatfield Reservoir on the south side of the Denver metro area. It was a really swampy site. You can see over on the left, there's pools of water right on the edge of a golf course. So they were sprinkling the golf course and all that water kept flowing through our site. And this dig was led primarily by our, our chief preparator, Natalie Toth, and our preparator, Salvador Bastion, and everyone else that you see in here our volunteers, our huge volunteer team, was able to go out and spend almost a month out there digging up this dinosaur. Here are some of the bones after we got them out of the muck, after Natalie and her teams got them out. And this is what those bones look like as they're coming out of those jacks. So those white blobs on the left contain all of the bones that we collected at the site. The ones you see here include a rib, a vertebra, so the one that three-pronged bone on the far right is a vertebra, the big bone at the top is the upper arm bone or the humerus. This jacket's really cool. So this one actually contains most of the face. So the big open area at the top, that's the orbit, the eye. Upside down and flipped away is the nose. This is actually the beak at the front of the snout. And then this is the lower beak wrapped around, the very bottom. So when we put it all together, based on what we've seen so far as we clean through these bones, is by far the most complete Triceratops individual ever found in Colorado. We have most of the face, most of the shield behind the head, and major parts of the body, including complete hip and sacrum, femur, shoulder blade, the forearm. So it's a really great picture of what Triceratops looked like here in the Denver basin, here in the Denver metro area. Some of the cool science that this is gonna help us address comes uh, from the north. So Triceratops is known from uh, what's called the Hell Creek Formation, which is in the Dakotas, Montana, and also the Lamp Creek Formation, which is in Wyoming. And from those formations, scientists have been able to piece together this really neat story of transition, where the bottom one, so down there at J, at the bottom is Triceratops horridus, the one, remember, that we found in Brighton. And then at the top, at the very top of the Hell Creek Formation, the other Triceratops, is known, Triceratops versus. And so that's the Triceratops that was around just before dinosaurs went extinct. What's really neat about the site at Highlands Ranch is it seems to be very close to the KT boundary, the KPG boundary, that extinction boundary that was on our initial map. So it's possible that that Triceratops belongs to the second species, tricer Triceratops versus. And then we can actually go back now and see in a separate place from the very far north if that same pattern of species transition is happening here in the Denver area. So it's some really cool science that I hope to work on with our other curator, Tyler Leeson, and our team of paleontologists here at the Denver. And then you probably notice another orange dinosaur on the screen. It doesn't match with all the red ones. Well, this is a cool story that came to us about two and a half years ago. A, a site up in Thornton, Colorado, was being developed for a public safety facility, so a police and fire station. And a bulldozer flipped the little pile of bones that you see right in the middle of the circle of construction. 
So those little white blobs are actually chunks of bone. It took us a couple of weeks to get those bones out of the ground, and it turned out to be the most complete Orosaurus type of horned dinosaur close to Triceratops ever found. So this is the skull laid out on a table in our collection. By far the most complete Cretaceous dinosaur skull from Colorado. And it's the most complete Orosaurus ever found anywhere on Earth. So we have at least 98 or 99% of the skull. We're only missing a couple little bits and pieces, um, little fragments here and there. Really cool specimen. And what's really neat is we also got parts of the skeleton. So with this, we can compare Taurosaurus to other horned dinosaurs, including the dinosaur that lived alongside it, Triceratops. We finished our preparation, and the next step has been reconstructing it. This is out in Fruta, Colorado, so out on the west slope by Grand Junction. This is what the skull is looking like as we put all those pieces back together as cast. This is being done by Gaston Design, a dinosaur fabrication company that's out in western Colorado. Here it is from the side. And notice in both of these views, those gigantic openings, those big windows in the frill in the back. Those would have in life been covered with soft tissue, uh, membrane, and skin, so they wouldn't have been open in life. It would have looked a lot like a triceratops frill. But in Taurosaurus, that's one of the main differences. So if you were to compare Taurosaurus on the top to Triceratops on the bottom, uh, there are a lot of differences. But from the Thornton find, we're going to be able to piece together some pretty cool science about how perhaps Taurosaurus was different ecologically. Um, but also, we're going to address a big burning question in paleontology, and that's whether or not Taurosaurus is even a valid species. So we know a ton of a ton about Triceratops. Triceratops is known from all over the American West, especially in the North. Uh, we have a full growth series. So you can see in this slide, we go from little babies in the upper left all the way to adults down in the lower right. So we can follow how they change through time. And one of the neat changes you see in the top all those young ones, the juveniles and subadults, have horns that curl back. And by the time you get to D and E, they've started to flatten out. And by the time you get to really old adult specimens, they even start to resorb or, or dissolve some of that horn, at least the bony part of it. A group up at the, the Museum of the Rockies up in Bozeman, Montana, has proposed that Triceratops, there at the top, goes through one final stage in its growth, and that is the dissolution the dissolving of some of the bone in the middle part of the frill become B, the Taurosaurus. So in their scheme, Triceratops, as it ages, goes from a solid frilled horned dinosaur to an open frilled, frilled horned dinosaur as it ages. The Taurosaurus is actually the adult form of Triceratops. We're really excited because we think that we can use the, the Thornton discovery from here in the Denver metro area to help address this question. So this is a hypothetical uh, growth line. Um, ignore the numbers on the left. Clearly, uh, uh, Triceratops didn't weigh 80 kilograms. It's only about 160 pounds. The scale is a little bit off, but the growth curve is what I'm using to illustrate. So we're going to, as we go through this, the process of conducting science on the, the Taurosaurus specimen, we're going to look at a bunch of Triceratops specimens as well. So imagine constructing a growth curve from juveniles to very old adult Triceratops, and that's what those blue dots on that curve represent. If our Taurosaurus from Thornton plots out at the very end of that growth curve, then that definitely doesn't refute the hypothesis that Triceratops is, is transitional and the Taurosaurus is just the adult form. However, if when we do this work, and this is called histology, cutting the bones and looking at how old they are, if that plots out in the middle of this curve, then that definitely sends a, a different signal. And it suggests that that hypothesis that Taurosaurus is the final stage of growth um, may not be true. So we were getting ready to cut our bones just before the museum closed down a few months ago, and we're really excited. Uh, as soon as we get back to the museum, we're going to start looking at not only Triceratops, but even Taurosaurus specimens from all over the West, hopefully to conduct a growth curve like this and test that hypothesis of whether or not Taurosaurus is a real valid uh, species of dinosaur or whether it's just the last phase of growth of Triceratops. Uh, a lot of this work takes time. So remember, we discovered the Taurosaurus way back in 2017, uh, been two and a half years now. 
it'll probably be at least another year or so before uh, the final results of what we're talking about actually come out in scientific literature. So stay tuned, hopefully this is coming up. And then the final dinosaur from here in the Denver Basin is up at the very top. So if you look at the, the little red one right below the arrow, this one comes from Weld County, from just outside of a town called Briggsdale, Colorado. This little skull was found in, a, in the mid 1980s on a, a private ranch owned by the Mapelli family. It was taken to CU Boulder, it was prepared there. And then the Mapellis decided to donate it back to Weld County. So this is currently on display behind a pane of glass, as you can see from this photograph, uh, at the Weld County facilities. Um, and we're currently working with our friends up in Weld County to bring this skull down. We're going to uh, do some more preparation and cleaning of it. And there's some really neat features of the skull that are really exciting to paleontologists like me. So even though it looks like a standard triceratops, it's got the big horns over the eyes, the big horn over the nose. There are some really neat features that suggest it might actually belong to something else. So if we go way up north to Alberta, so follow the Rockies all the way up north across the Canadian border to Alberta, this dinosaur was found several years ago. It's called Eotriceratops. We know Eotriceratops uh, is uh, a very large skull. It's based on a, a pretty fragmentary skeleton and skull, but it's from a very old layer up in Alberta. It's about 69 to 70 million years old. And when we plot out our Triceratops from Weld County, it actually comes out in the Laramie Formation. So if you look there on the left, you see the different rock units. So the Weld, Weld specimen might actually be an Eotriceratops because we think it's from about the same age as that discovery up in Canada. We think that this could be a totally different type of dinosaur. And if it is, then it represents one of the best specimens of Eotriceratops ever found. So right there, just the Denver Basin alone, if we are able to verify that the Highlands Ranch specimen is a different type of Triceratops, Triceratops versus, we might have as many as four different species of foreign dinosaurs from this little snapshot in time, last three million years of dinosaurs evolution. The last dinosaur known from Colorado, even though we have tons of fossils from the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous, we don't have a lot of other horned dinosaurs outside of the Denver Basin. But, but the only other one that we do have is this little yellow uh, one over here south of the town of Range in northwestern Colorado. And this comes from a period of time about 8 to 10 million years before the ones in the Denver Basin, so about 74 to 73 million years ago. And this is what North America would have looked like at the time. Uh, it was cut in half by a big shallow seaway that connected the Caribbean to the Arctic. And that landmass you see on the left with all the mountain chains is something we call Laramidia. And Laramidia was ruled by early Tyrannosaurus, so a T. rex relative on land, and then gigantic crocodiles, this is called Dinosuchus, along the coasts and the river. It was also a, a hotbed of dinosaur evolution for horned dinosaurs. So there you see on the left a bizarre horned dinosaur from Laramidia. Also a ductile dinosaur, so the tube-crested Parasaurolophus you see there on the right. And again, early Tyrannosaurus were the, the main predator. The find up in northwestern Colorado has always been a bit of a mystery. The specimen itself is a really nice part of a skull of a juvenile. We know it's a juvenile because a lot of the features of the skull haven't fully fused together. So these little horns on the edge of the frill, see how they're still separate and haven't fused onto the frill fully. And the size of the skull is pretty small as well. And that makes it really challenging to identify what type of dinosaur it is. But for a long time, we've considered this to be a pentaceratops. Pentaceratops is known from rocks that are about 75 million years old in northwestern New Mexico. This is a pentaceratops uh, based on some of the discoveries we've made at the Denver Museum down in this part of the, the country. We have at least six or seven uh, partial skulls of pentaceratops that we're cleaning in our lab right now. But when you look at the one from northwestern Colorado, here in green, it's quite a bit younger than pentaceratops. So we think that the dinosaurs up in northwestern Colorado are new, probably a different type of horned dinosaur, and there's just not quite enough yet to name it. And so we're hoping to go back out to this part of Colorado later this year and in the coming years to keep looking for evidence of this type of horned dinosaur 
and other parts of the ecosystem as well. So the turtles and the crocodiles, the tyrannosaurs, the gut billed dinosaurs, all those are really important to the story of Laramidia and trying to understand how these dinosaurs change through time. And that's something that we call the Laramidia Project. It's a big, been a big push for the last eight years to work in places like Southern Utah, Northwestern New Mexico, down even in the Big Bend region of Texas, because we're able to piece together this really cool ecosystem from the plants and the insects all the way up to the big dinosaurs and see how dinosaur ecosystems change under the influence of shifting climate, shifting sea levels, and even mountain building and big tectonic or big land moving. Down in Southern Utah is a hotbed of dinosaur research right now. Um, we've been working on several of these dinosaurs. We've been lucky enough to collect uh, specimens of Utah Ceratops and Cosmo Ceratops, the two on the left recently. And over the last few years, we've collected and cleaned a couple of new dinosaurs. So even though these aren't from Colorado, I'm gonna introduce you to a couple of the new horned dinosaurs that we're conducting research on because they are relevant to some of the dinosaurs coming out of Colorado. So this is a new horned dinosaur based on several skulls. We actually have seven partial skulls from multiple age groups of this new horned dinosaur. And over the last two or three years, we've been working on this site. These are dinosaur, horned dinosaur bones from Southern Utah that we think based on what our early preparation in the lab shown is a new type of horned dinosaur. So right now we have two new species from Southern Utah. And we're going to continue doing work up in northwestern Colorado to see if we can fill in that big gap. And so with that, that was a big, fast overview of all of the horned dinosaurs of Colorado. And I'm really excited to answer your questions. I don't want to use up all of this time on dinosaur picture. That's great. Thank you so much. I feel like I always learn so many things at uh, these Science Division live events. So again, thank you to everyone on Facebook for joining us. Um, if you would like to throw in some questions in the chat, just let us know. Um, we are definitely watching that. The first question that ever popped up is a little shady. So I'm just going to throw it out there for you, Dr. Sardich, and you can take it as you want. This is from Doug Shore. He says, why aren't ceratopsians as cool as theropods? So theropods are the meat-eating dinosaurs, things like tyrannosaurs and velociraptor and the raptor dinosaurs. Uh, a lot of people love meat-eating dinosaurs because they're the, the scary monsters, right? Uh, they're the types of dinosaurs that uh, we build movie franchises around, like Jurassic Park and Jurassic World. Um, I think horned dinosaurs are as cool as those. Uh, they definitely teach us more about uh, things like the evolution of bizarre structures, um, and they're also one of the fastest evolving groups of dinosaurs that we know. So those are the ones that we can look to to understand how dinosaur evolution is influenced by things like climate. Very cool. Um, you talked about a bunch of skulls that we still have here in Colorado. Will any of the skulls you talked about ever be on display at the museum? Well, one of them is on display already. That's the Brighton Triceratops. Uh, we're still piecing together the Thornton Taurosaurus, and hopefully we find a spot for that to show it off. It's such a beautiful specimen, so hopefully down the road we can. And then all those other new species, there are lots of plans for us to, to get those out at some point and share the discoveries at the very least when we name those. That's fantastic. Um, just one final question for you. Um, oh, here's one right from Facebook. Does the museum have artists of their own that work with you to envision these dinosaurs when you make new discoveries in Colorado? So we work with paleo artists or paleontological artists all over the country for all of our various projects. Um, one of our, our best friends in paleo art is an artist called named Andre Atuchin, and he lives in eastern Russia out in Siberia. He does a lot of the paintings that I showed you uh, in my talk, talk today. Uh, we don't have anyone currently on staff at the museum that is a professional paleo artist, although a lot of our staff, uh, me included, love to draw dinosaurs. The one on my shirt here is one that I drew years ago. Awesome. All right, two final questions. Besides the Triceratops tracks in Golden, are there other tracks that you can find in Colorado? Yeah, so the tracks that you see up in Golden and over at Dinosaur Ridge follow a big chain of dinosaur trackways that go all the way from Southern Colorado to Northern Colorado. That first hogback 
along the, the front range of the Rockies, that first fin of sandstone is loaded with tracks. If you go out to western Colorado, you can also find tracks uh, just off the highway near Grand Junction. Um, tracks are one of the, the most common types of dinosaur fossils that we find here in Colorado. If you go back to the Jurassic, there's another set of tracks um, that you can find in the Morris Formation. One of the best trackways in the world is located in southeastern Colorado in a place called Picket Fire Canyon. Awesome. And then our final question, you can answer this however you'd like. How do I be, be as cool as you, Joe? <laughs> well, I don't think I'm very cool, uh, but if you want to do a cool job that I do with paleontology and going out and digging dinosaurs, uh, I would say uh, it's a really fun thing to do. You can do it as either a volunteer or a professional, um, and you get a chance to learn about not only the history of the world, but the way evolution works through deep time, and you get to follow uh, follow dinosaurs as they change through the rock record. Very cool. This was a great talk um, with you, and we welcome our Facebook audience to come back again tomorrow um, for our final uh, Science Division Live this week. Um, tomorrow we're talking about what, Dr. Sirtis? Tomorrow is Endangered Species Today, day, and we'll have our Vice President of the Science Division, Dr. Gabriela Shavaria, talking about endangered species. I'm excited. All right, we'll see you guys all tomorrow. And thank you again, Dr. Sertich, for being here today. Yeah, thank you all for joining me. It was fun.